To be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to be a risk taker. And our guest today stays ahead of the game by changing his risk profile every few years. This is the Architects of Business, Joe's weekly series of interviews with leading entrepreneurs in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. I'm Ty Genwright, and today we'll hear from John Purdy, who, like so many in tech, set up Ergo in a back bedroom. John, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Um, you know, looking into Ergo's history, 25 years ago it was founded in the whole kind of IT space, and you must have seen so many changes in that period in terms of even what it is you, you deliver, you provide your clients. What we do today is thousands of miles away from what we did 25 years ago. We work on the principle that what we sell today will not be valued by our customer in three years' time, which means that we've got to stay on the edge of innovation all the time. We've got to be pushing up the value chain. We've got to be looking at our proposition uh, and what value we bring to our customers. Uh, when we talk to a customer, we talk about the outcomes that we deliver. So one of my favorite phrases is the CEO of an organization is not going to go out to dinner next Friday night, and he or she is not going to talk about is there data in the cloud, is it virtualized, et cetera. They're going to talk about, have I retained customers? Have I won customers? Have I improved my margin? Am I collecting my cash? Have I more satisfied customers? So our job is to ensure that those outcomes are delivered. So we, we ensure that we hire people that are very comfortable with that whole change piece. Being uh, you know, on the cutting edge all the time or just keeping ahead of the game, it must be exhausting. Absolutely <laughs> exhausting. Uh, but we live on the adrenaline of it. Uh, we live on the fact that uh, we know we've got to stay relevant to our customers. We know that if we're not disrupting, that we will be disrupted. Uh, and that uh, paranoia around that keeps us very much alive to the need to change all the time. Mm. What surprised you most when you look back at all the evolutions and revolutions that there have been in, in, the, in the 25 years that you guys have been in business? Well, uh, is there any kind of one or even several individual developments that have kind of taken you by surprise? Absolutely. I think the, uh, there's, there's quite a number. Clearly, the Internet had a massive uh, impact on people's lives and on our business. I can remember customers uh, installing uh, the Internet for the first time uh, and having dial-up Internet uh, and the, the wellness that that created. And now, you know, it's, it's, it's information everywhere. It's work anywhere. Uh, it's 24-7. Uh, so the infrastructure, the governance, the controls need to be, in, need, need to be there to ensure that it's, it's provided in a very safe way. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's been a huge change uh, to people's lives um, and is a huge driver of business value. Mm. What about kind of individual tools? Because, I mean, you talk about the Internet, and obviously that's an all-encompassing thing these days. But, you know, I can remember at the dawn of the smartphone, people saying, you know, something someday you're going to be doing everything on this thing. And sure. there's a certain degree of, of cynicism with that. Sure. And thinking, yeah, sure, right. And then increasingly realize, this is my life. Mm. And this is, you know, I hold mm. it in my right hand mm. and it is my right hand mm. and I'd be lost without it. So email is the biggest um, advantage and disadvantage a company can have um, because you're you're always available, you're always on. There's an awful lot of nonsense delivered through email that doesn't need to be delivered through email. Uh, and I think, you know, organizations and indiv individuals have to be disciplined around that. But I suppose if you look um, at unified communications, um, so uh, products like Skype from Microsoft, uh, they have changed the way people uh, work. This morning is a horrible wet mo morning in Ireland. Uh, and you, you bet there's a huge amount of people working very productively from home because they have the availability of uh, broadband in most areas that, and they've got the availability of, 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 of products like Skype so they can get involved in conference calls, they can talk to customers, they can talk to suppliers across the globe, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I, it took me an hour and a half to drive here this morning uh, and I was involved in maybe six different telephone calls uh, with multiple people because I could dial into sk Skype. Mm, indeed, it's a changed world and um, no, less need for umbrellas, thankfully. <laughs> um, listen, take us back to the very beginning, 
little John, young John. Yeah. Um, what about the upbringing? So it was a very good upbringing. I came from a uh, very much a working class uh, family. Um, I was one of six children, um, born in Finglas. Uh, I uh, did my leaving cert in 1980. Uh, my father died in 1981. I'd been sick for quite some time. So the idea of going to college wasn't uh, a runner. Uh, my mother uh, did two cleaning jobs to make it all happen. Um, so I started doing college at night. Um, I suppose the uh, I always I didn't understand what an entrepreneur was, but looking back, I always had this gene uh, inside me that wanted to do something that was a bit different. So your, your dad passed away the year after you, you th- did yes. the leaving. Where were you in that you know chain of six kids? So I was child number four, and I was the oldest son. So I had two brothers who were younger than me. And uh, you know, did that make you feel like you needed to? to step up to maybe, you know, play more of a role in a way that a, 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 an adult or a child of that age wouldn't normally have to? I think on reflection, possibly. Um, and certainly that pressure didn't come from my mother. Um, but uh, I think it came from within uh, that I needed to make a contribution and I needed to, I suppose, drive my own uh, agenda and my own career. Mm. What kind of, uh, you know, role models were, were your parents for you when it came to putting you on the path that you, you went on to? So I think particularly my mother um, was uh, very strong and that you can do whatever you need to do or want to do or can do, uh, that you have the ability. Uh, you know, I remember telling my mother that I was leaving this safe job and I was setting up uh, Ergo with with uh, Tim Sheedy, my lifelong friend. Uh, and we had a conversation and I said I had fears and she said what's the worst thing can happen and I said I fail so that's the worst thing um, so it doesn't get any worse than that no so what's stopping you go and try it go and see what happens uh, and drive yourself hard were you surprised by that advice at the time did you think she might tell you to stick with the safe job no uh, I think she saw um a different life for people who worked hard, who worked differently, um, who changed the circumstances. Uh, you know, so I think I think she was a very normal but very inspirational woman. Do you think that's the typical advice that a, an Irish mom of her time would have given them? I don't believe so. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think parents always like to be safe, you know, go to the right school, do the right college degree, uh, uh, you know, go into the big four, go into a law firm, do medicine, etc. And it's something that I'm very passionate about because I think entrepreneurship should be taught in second level. And now we're starting to see it being taught in third level. And I'm very happy about that. And in fact, in one of my roles, um, I sit on the alumni board for the Entrepreneur of the Year program and uh, I chair a subcommittee which faces off to government departments around taxation, around entrepreneurship, uh, education um, and uh, talent management. And finally, the development of uh, enterprise uh, outside the major cities in Ireland. So I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm very passionate about uh, entrepreneurship being developed within the um, education system. What was it within the education system, or perhaps it was another influence that set you onto the, you know, the the, the road of IT? Well, I I, I think um, in life you meet people they're, they're, and they influence you. They're your parents, uh, your friends, teachers, uh, and so on. And I think I was very fortunate in school uh, that I met uh, some great teachers um, who really watched out for me. Um, some of which I still meet a couple of times a year for dinner. Um, I, I, I met uh, this, life, this guy who became my lifelong friend, Tim Sheehy, who was 20 years older than me, and had been in business for quite some time. And he would have nurtured me, got to the point when we, got, when we went and did something together. And that's how Ergo was founded. Mm. I, I just wonder, though, do you think that IT, maybe less so now than it was back then, but is it a bit more egalitarian? I mean, you mentioned earlier about how a lot of parents might p- 
push their kids towards some of the you know the traditional professions be yeah. be an accountant be a doctor yeah. uh, or be a lawyer and perhaps those professions might look a bit snootily on on a kid from Finglas whose mum was a cleaner absolutely um and in fact i i should clarify when we talk about starting in it we were starting uh, in 1993 recycling components uh, with it for, for IT. So this was very non-glamorous. Uh, this, was, this was very, very basic. So you were taking computer, should we say, waste? Components, yeah, and rebuilding them and selling them again. Wow. Yeah. The uh, earliest recyclers. Uh, but but we, I suppose we realised in um, uh, at that very early stage, we realised we had to go up the value chain. Um, and that there wasn't a, there wasn't a sustainable business uh, in what we were doing. Um, I, we've always had and still have a view that we behave like a big business, and that's not a, in an arrogant way because we're definitely not that. Uh, but in terms of planning, uh, budgeting, uh, strategy, uh, our board, um, we think as if we're we are a much bigger organisation. Because that's where we want to be. So when you enter our building, uh, either through a lift or through stairs, there's a big red p- panel that says, uh, ergo, a world-class IT provider. Uh, that's, w- that's what we aim to be. So we're reminded of that every single day of the week. But listen, you didn't start out like that, did no, you? No. How did you start out? So we started in a, uh, a back bedroom in my house um, and in Tim's garage in Cabra. Um, and... Uh, uh, something terribly strategic happened. Uh, my wife became pregnant and we needed a back bedroom. Um, so we had to move out and uh, uh, we moved into a, a shed, a, a bigger shed in Cross Guns Bridge in Fisbury. And uh, we rented it off this guy and uh, it had no running water, a tarmac on the ground. Um, we'd fill up um, our, our kettle from a, a standpipe in the yard. And we wait for uh, the guy in the building next door to come in if we wanted to use the bathroom. So this was this was very humble, but gave us a, a great start. It gave us a great basis of you manage costs extremely tightly. And from that point, you can build something substantial. You're not the only computer firm started doing things in a garage, no, are you? No, no, but uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Euler and Mr. Packard are a bit bigger than we are. And Mr. Jobs and Mr. And Wozniak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Um, you know, those early days, you were recycling old components and turning it into in, into newer kit. Was there a level of, you know, did you have to overcome a trust hurdle there? Because, you know, somebody's going out to buy a computer, particularly back in, what year are we talking about 93. again? 93. 93. They're heading to their, you know, their power city or yeah, wherever yeah, yeah. and buying yeah. a Hewlett Packard sure. at the time. Sure. They're not necessarily looking for something that's come from a from a shed in Fibsborough. Sure, but we were uh, we worked really hard to build that trust with customers. Some of which are still customers today. Um, we uh, we were very personal. Um, uh, we we made sure we stood by everything. So if somebody wanted to us at three o'clock on a uh, on a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon, we were there and we're still there. Uh, and uh, you know we're we're still providing that level of service with that ethos and that DNA in our team. But you're not doing that oh, anymore. We stopped doing that probably in 1995. How quickly did, did it all change and, and, and evolve? So the, I go back to my earlier point. We change every three years, um, almost completely. And uh, is, is that and part it, of a plan? Yes, and it's a gradual change. So it doesn't, you know, so we're not going to change again in 2021. We're changing this month, next month, et cetera, et cetera, with a view of being in a different place in 2021. So so even if, if you look at the breadth of services that we now offer, we offer a 24 by 7, 365 support organization um, that's serving customers um, across the globe in 30 something countries. Um, we are dealing with very, very critical requirements on behalf of customers. Um, in multi-million euro projects down to much smaller projects. Um, so uh, we own that on behalf of the customer. Uh, we, we understand that the uh, we've got to move into areas like machine learning uh, much faster than we are today in artificial intelligence, uh, in IoT, all of those kind of things. So, th- so that's, that's 100 million miles away from where we were 
10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting um, approach and what I didn't fully appreciate before. You know, you, you have this three yearly reviews as to, to what we're doing, where we're going, what we need to do next. Yes. I mean, as things move increasingly fast, yeah. does it ever happen that, actually, you know something, we need to bring this meeting forward, this every three yearly review forward? Cause so, so, so let's clarify that, Tyg. We have a view of where we want to be in three years' time, but we, we work every week to get closer to that view. And then every year we change that view. So we're continually, you know, 2021 view becomes 22 view and so on and so forth. Um, so there is a, a fairly detailed plan of where we want to be from an income, from, from a customer perspective, from a technology perspective, from a people perspective. So, so last week we launched what we call the Ergo Academy. The Ergo Academy is where we're identifying uh, in this case, 25 um, high potential leaders who uh, need to be trained. And we're doing this in conjunction with UCC uh, and we'll apply a level of academia, plus we'll also apply a level of practical smarts. Uh, we'll use people in our own network, we'll use customers and we'll take these people out of the business for a couple of days a month for 18 months and we'll give them a toolkit uh, so they can become better leaders. And th this is the second time we've done this. B business is, is, is a busy business. I think that's where the word comes from. Sure. Uh, and, and I know lots of other entrepreneurs, you know, they're, 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 they're working long days and they barely have time to, to think about sure. three years' time. Um, you know, how would you advise them, others, on how to, to make that time, to kind of take that step back and take a look at the bigger picture and where things are going? So look, 20 years ago, I was involved in every deal. Um, I was involved in every customer situation. Um, 10 years ago, that became less. Five years ago, that became less. And I, I should clarify that. Um, I still spend about 40% of my time in front of customers because that's where we learn most about our business. Uh, we don't learn at sitting in boardrooms. Um, and talking to customers and having coffee with customers is really important. And I encourage all of my own colleagues, my own team, uh, to, to do that on a very regular basis. Uh, forget about the laptop, forget about the notebook, just go and understand what the issues are of your customer. Just drink coffee, okay? Um, so the, uh, clearly I'm not involved in every transaction today because we've 435 people, so uh, they're well qualified and better qualified than I am to deal with this. My job is to create a platform where people can grow and develop uh, and we can scale our business. Um, and we do that through a level of formal reviews and uh, making sure that we have tight relationships with, and rela uh, relationships that are really important with our customers. And face-to-face -face relationships over coffee, maybe not over email or over a video call? Not very, so always the preference is face-to-face. You know, my view is if we're going to ask the customer for a chunk of cash, it's always better to do that face to face uh, because you can react, you can you can deal with the scenario, et cetera, et cetera. So much gets lost on email. Email is a um, is a very necessary uh, tool. Uh, but, you know, if I'm going to ask somebody for a, the trust to run their IT for the next five years, I can't do that by email. Get on, get, you know, get in the car and travel to the customer or get on an airplane and travel to the customer. Uh, don't ask for that business over the phone. What's the biggest win you ever had at Ergo? Um, so, uh, we, uh, in the last couple of years, we've had two very substantial wins. Um, uh, one is that we run IT on behalf of a company called Aircap, which is an aircraft leasing business, um, which has assets all around the globe. And uh, we run that business 24-7. Um, we also run uh, IT for CIE and all its group companies, um, and they are multi-year, uh, multi-euro deals. But also you work for Microsoft. So we work, we, we've got two relationships with Microsoft. So we're a partner of Microsoft, so we use and sell and promote our technology. And then we also provide uh, services back into Microsoft um, to some of their direct customers. Um, which is a, a very interesting dynamic. So to be chosen, uh, you know, from, from a field of competitors to work with 
the best known software company in the world. That I mean, I, I expected you to tell me that whenever you I talked about biggest wins. That's, sure. that's quite an endorsement. Sure, sure. Um, and it's a it's a. Uh, I think we signed our first deal with Microsoft on the fourteenth of May, nineteen ninety eight. I can be very specific about that because it was my tenth wedding anniversary. And five years after you're working out of your back bedroom. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know we work really hard in that relationship. Um, we're connected at all kinds of levels um, to ensure that we're not complacent, that we stay relevant, that we continue to drive value, um, all of that kind of stuff. Do you remember the feeling when you made that deal? Absolutely. Yeah. I. Uh, I. 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 Uh, it. It. It was unbelievable because it was a validation that what we were doing was right. It was a validation that we could uh, compete aggressively in the marketplace. You know, we talk about. Um, that we are uh, internally, we talk about that we're, we we want to be gazelles competing against gorillas, okay? Um, so we want to be we want to have the right level of governance, but the level of speed and agility. Um, and we, when we're faced off against competitors, which are big and cumbersome, and where decision making happens in other cities or other countries in the world, you know, you can get decisions made from us very quickly. You know, we 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 talk about uh, we just don't tolerate status quo. In fact, one of my colleagues said to me recently when we were talking about this that you know we see status quo as a as a rock band from the eighties. That's the only thing that 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 status quo is in our business. John, from what I understand, it was when you started working with banks that you kind of made your greatest strides. Is that right? So in uh, two thousand and six. Um, a very significant proportion of our then turnover was in um, banks in Ireland um, and uh, uh, tier one and tier two banks. And um, quite frankly, we couldn't deliver stuff fast enough. Uh, and I think uh, by 2008, about 40 percent of our income was um, involved in banking. And one very substantial bank, which was Bank of Scotland at the time, would have been a big portion of that uh, 40%. And life was great. Um, and uh, I remember uh, uh, it was the 2nd of July, uh, 2008, I got a phone call from our financial, uh, or f- sorry, from our sales director, uh, uh, Mark Murphy. And uh, he said, look, something really strange is happening. Our pipeline is evaporating. Uh, I can't see stuff beyond the next couple of of months, and so we knew we we had a problem. Um, I that that I was in uh, uh, my last day of a two year course in Stanford University, which was sponsored by Enterprise Ireland, which was a phenomenal experience. And uh, so I was then going on holidays uh, from the fourth of July, and every day for my two weeks at eight o'clock in the morning, Boston time. Um, we had an hour's call to see what we we're going to do. So uh, the options were we get rid of all of this skill set and send them home um, or we fight like hell to figure out uh, how we're going to sustain this level of business. It must have been a confusing time because, I mean, I, I wonder, selling software to banks, did you actually have to have an understanding as to what was going on behind their scenes or was it just a case of, you know, giving them the, the, the kit they need? So... Uh, I think the answer to that is a little bit of both. Um, so we d- this didn't come as a complete surprise. You know, we did have uh, indications that there was uh, clouds gathering. Um, so the decision was made that we would retain most of that team. Uh, and we went and literally scrapped looking for business. Uh, and we kept them funded, okay, uh, by doing all kinds of different things for banks. We figured out very quickly that banks needed different services. They didn't need software that allowed them lend more money. They needed software that allowed them ensure that the money they'd lent they could get back, that they had governance over that money, etc. We also became very conscious that uh, banks were heading into a, an era of significant uh, regulation. And we heard new new terms were coming at us like uh, Sarbanes Oxley and Mifid and Frank Dodd and all of these things that we've now become very familiar with. 
And we started building a software platform to help banks deal with that. And we aggressively funded that business um, from 2000 and probably nine. Uh, and in 2012, we lifted that business out of Ergo and created Finergo. Finergo went on to raise some external money and we uh, exited the majority of our shareholding in 2015 at a valuation of 85 million. I mean, that it is a remarkable story that at a time when the, you know, it felt like the financial system was, was, was collapsing all around us. And yes, you're right, people were, people weren't necessarily even thinking of how to fix the future at that stage. It was putting out the fire that we saw all around us sure. at the time. Sure. What was the lifespan or, or the gestation, shall we say, of that idea to start creating the, the software for the, the, the next generation of perhaps more, more careful banking? So the, the, we, uh, we, got a, we got our first deal reasonably quickly, okay? Uh, and that was fantastic. It took us two years to find a second deal, okay? And that was tough. Uh, but we knew we had something that was very special and we stuck with it. Uh, it would, would have been much easier to fold it uh, and just carry on with the rest of our business. Um, but, you know, there's, there was, uh, uh, if, if you go back to my old notebooks, uh, and I keep all my old notebooks, um, I used to write three letters at the top of uh, every page for a new meeting. And the three letters were B, 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 okay? Be brave be bold, uh, and the third one has just gone straight out of my head. Uh, be, <laughs> it's one of the Bs. Sorry, no, I know what it is. <laughs> be, 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 be brave, be bold, believe. Okay? Uh, and I think that's really important that if, you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're going to do something that's substantial, you've got to be brave. You've got to be bold. You can't just think around the edges. Um, you've got you've to you've break all the rules, and you've got to believe that what you're doing is the right thing. Uh, and I hope to God you 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 were right. But listen, writing all those B's in the top of the page must have suggested that behind the scenes you were also afraid. And and, and 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 how bad did things look? So, like one of the things Ty, that I'm 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 I've been very focused on since day one is that you know we want to make sure that we make payroll every month on the last Friday that we're not sending anyone home without money in their bank. Um, and that's, that is my number one priority. Uh, and when we had 10 people or 50 people or now 500 people uh, or close to 500 people, th that, that's still the focus. Um, and that's, that's my number one priority. And I think if, 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 you know, profits will come, markets will go up and down. But if we focus on that, I think we'll have a very dedicated team and we can get through a lot of stuff together. But there must have been, therefore, some months where that was a, a real struggle. I mean, how bad did it get? So, so it, look, it, you know, when we were bootstrapping Finergo, uh, you know, my CFO would come in uh, every other day and say, this thing is costing us a quarter of a million um, a month. Uh, and our reserves are dwindling. And every penny we're making in the other part of the business, we're pumping in here. Um, I need you to be aware of that. And I'd say, Mark, I'm very much aware of it. OK, we keep going. We keep going. Um, and, you know, it's it's maybe that's the madness of being an entrepreneur. Um, but I think that's 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 kind of important. You know, they, 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 there's a number of really interesting things. Um, so in the middle of all of this, um, we uh, clearly, you know, our banking income had dipped. Uh, general income had dipped. Um, so managing all of that is it was 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 really was really challenging, and I think personally, um, uh, I had to manage my own energy um, and my own well-being, um, and you know, uh, and I still I still practice this today. Um, you know, I try four or five times a week to put on a set of headphones and just go out and walk or cycle or or do something, but just to create that space for yourself so you can. You can check in with yourself. You can organize yourself so that you're a nice person to work with, a nice person to live with, all of that kind of stuff. Well, at what stage did you realize that, that you needed to, to, to practice some self-care? I think very early in that process. Um, I think around 2008, 2009, um, that became really important to me because, you know, you're, you're, my head at times was like a, a bowl of spaghetti or, you know, a bowl of mushy peas or something and you just needed to just just create space um, 
so you can think, think things out uh, clearly. And I guess it works differently for different people, Absolutely. but why did your solution work for you, do you think? So it's, it's headphones and out for a walk, is that it? It's, it's, it's headphones or out for a walk, um, or, you know, I was doing, back then I was doing a little bit of running, I can't run anymore. Um, uh, but it's just to create that time um, where, you know, you're not engaged with other people, you know, you're, 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 it's you and your thoughts and you're clearing your head. Um, and, you know, one, one of the, a, a wise man said to me a long time ago, if you can't be happy with your own company, don't expect other people to be. Um, uh, and, you know, and I was very conscious that, you know, I, I was going home to, uh, to uh, a wife and, and two sons and, you know, they didn't want me taking out the frustration that was going on in my work life uh, on them. OK, so I had to deal with that. Mm. And that's, I guess, one of the luxuries of being your own boss, that you can you can decide I'm taking this time and that you need this time. Sure. But I guess sometimes when, when when you're an employee, yeah, your boss doesn't always kind of uh, yeah. isn't so forgiving. Well, you know, you know, um, I think we've realized that because um, I spend one and a half to two hours every Wednesday morning with our people and culture team and uh, and we focus on. Uh, retaining our staff, attracting new ta- staff. Uh, what is it we have to do to make our staff happier to work here than work for another organisation? And we've done a lot of work on that in recent months. Um, and, you know, we have we've 430 odd people and we have 120 desks. Uh, so we don't care where you work. Just work. OK, make sure we give them the tools. If, if it's right for you and you're the kind of person that can work from home, well, then work from home full time, some time. If you want to drop your kids to school in the morning and start at 10, well then do that. Just make sure we have the outcomes. If you want to go and see uh, your daughter or son in the uh, 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 play in school, make sure you do that because that's important. Uh, but And we'll get that back in space. But I wonder, is that also because particularly the, the tech sector that you're in, is intensely competitive right now for, for getting the right people. Absolutely. And, and, if you, and if you don't do that, they might be attracted to, you know, the, the Googles, Googles or the Facebooks yeah, or whatever yeah, this world yeah. where people, you know, the, the impression is people are going around in space hoppers and, yeah. and having handsome free lunches. Yeah, yeah. So we can't compete with that. So therefore, we've got to create our own, our own environment. Um, we talk about the, uh, when we hire people, about the DNA. Um, and so, of course, we have to look at what the the subject matter expertise is and ensure that we have the right person that either has it now or can get there. But we hire people who are like minded, who are happy with this change ma- mantra, who uh, have who are agile and who want to do something different. So we'll, f- we'll fail if we hire someone just to do the job now. We're really looking at people who are capable of doing a bigger job in two or three years' time. And that goes back to the, the, to the academy I spoke about. Does it make life um, harder or easier for you, the fact that also in, in, in this town in Dublin, there are so many of the world's top tech heavyweights with their, you know, their Europe, Middle East, Africa uh, headquarters here? Does that, how does that you know, leave you as a kind of a, a smaller player? So it's, it's, a, it's a double-sided coin. Um, it creates an ecosystem. It creates work for us, but we're also feeding out of the same pool. Um, so um, we can't on one hand say we don't want these people in our town. Uh, we do want them in our town. They are creating wealth. They are creating opportunities for companies like, like us to serve them. Uh, so we've got to figure out within the ecosystem how we play. Um, and we just have to have a different game plan in order to, to compete. Um, and, you know, the... The, the trust, the flexibility, making sure we've got a benefit packet at work, making sure that we're competing on salary, making sure we're competing on training um, and, and future prospects. Like, so w- one of the things I think that we have really successfully done is we've spoken about Finergo as a spin-out company. So we, we've looked at this concept of intrapreneurs. Okay, we have a second company called Flowforma, uh, which is much smaller, uh, it's uh, much younger, and that has been spun out of Ergo. And we have a third company, which we're bootstrapping, and we're trying to decide whether or not, and I think it will, whether we can bootstrap it. 
uh, into it, where we can spin it out into a, another company. So, you know, from that shed in Cabra and that back bedroom, um, there is now three, maybe four different companies. And the, the cumulative number of jobs is about 1,600. Fantastic achievement. Um, looking back over those 25 years since he started in that um, shed or bedroom in, in, in Cabra, what do you think are the most important things you've learned? Um, I suppose about two things, about business and about yourself. Uh, so we're obsessive about the people who we work with. We're obsessive about our culture. We're obsessive about our proposition. And we're obsessive about our customers. Okay, And I think we've got to be obsessive. Uh, because there's a whole lot of people who will displace us if we're not. Um, I think in the sector that we're in, we've got to be very comfortable with change. Um, uh, we have to really mind our customers, really offer value, have connections with our customers um, uh, at, the, uh, at the highest levels. So we, we have, a, we have a, a concept whereby I personally and my senior team each have a chunk of customers where we're the exec sponsor. So I'll go and I'll meet a senior person, a, a C-level person in that customer uh, once a quarter and have a coffee and understand what their business requirements are and hear how we're serving them. So we've got to stay really connected. What I've learned about myself is uh, that I, um, I'm very stubborn. Um, I, I, I think I'm good at bringing a team with me. Um, um, I, I like to feel that I'm trusted by my colleagues and I'm trusted by my customers. Who do you turn to when you need advice or support? Uh, so I, 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 I'm 30 years married. I have a great wife, Audrey, um, who, uh, who's really good at grounding me. Um, I have a, a guy that's uh, I have two sons, I have a, a keen who will tell me almost once a week that I'm a gobshite that just got lucky. Um, <laughs> um, Is he right? Uh, <laughs> probably, <laughs> uh, possibly. Um, uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I have found the friendship, the support uh, from the alumni in the Entrepreneur of the Year program as being really important. You know, you can have conversations which you can't have with your senior team, you can't have with your banks. Um, and, you know, some, during some difficult years, uh, I've had... Uh, some of those conversations uh, where I needed advice or other people needed um, uh, advice from me. You know, there, 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 the, uh, there's some unofficial mentoring going on even between uh, me and uh, some of my colleagues in the EOY program and, uh, and, and even some of their teams and vice versa. So this is a very powerful group of people who have empathy for the needs that, that, that we each other have. From, from a business perspective, when you look back, what are the things that you're most proud of? Or what's the one thing that really stands out that you're most proud of? Uh, you know, there's, 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 there's really so many of those things. Um, I, uh, I'm very proud that we've made payroll every month, okay? Uh, I'm very proud that we're, we've grown by 320% in the last four years. I'm very proud that we've spun off two product companies, um, one that has grown to being a, a global leader. Uh, I'm very proud that I won uh, industry category in 2004 uh, in the EY program. And it was good. It was great for me, for my colleagues, for the business, for the employer brand, uh, for everybody. Um, so I have a huge amount to be grateful for. What about regrets? I have very few significant regrets. Um, I have some very minor regrets about maybe, you know, not hiring a person at a particular time or um, not winning a certain piece of business because maybe we didn't try hard enough or we didn't demonstrate hard enough for it, etc. cetera. Um, but I have no significant regrets. What about, or has there been a time where maybe you put the, the business before your personal life Any absolutely um, I think the I think a lot of entrepreneurs including me do that on a constant basis I do it less so now 
Um, but, you know, certainly when the children were smaller, um, you know, you weren't there for every uh, rugby match. You weren't there or soccer match. You weren't there for every nativity play, etc. cetera. Um, I, try, I try to balance that a little bit over the years because I, I ended up coaching both uh, my son's football teams. One, the eldest guy, Connor, until 21, uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, getting guys up on a Sunday morning out of bed when they're when they're 20 years of age, that's a challenge. And I've just finished with the younger guy, uh, and they finished at under-19s. So I made sure uh, almost every week that I had that connection with them at training or, or on, on Sundays. And I guess, I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and kind of frame that that they're, they're not being there at certain points as a, as a regret, but I mean, is was it a regret or is it actually just a necessity? I think it's a necessity. Uh, but there, you know, there. Uh, I had a conversation with with a friend of mine recently who who a very senior guy in 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 Microsoft, and we spoke about so even when we're on holidays, being present, okay. Uh, so in you know sneaking around the back of the pool to check your emails or get on a conference call. Uh, and I think we need to learn more about being present when we're not working, um, you know, with, with, with family and, and, and relationships and so on. So what does the next 10 years look like for you? Uh, so I'm 56 years of age. Uh, we have a, a, a plan uh, to get to 100 million um, by 2020. I think we're going to do it in 2019. Um, we're starting to build a plan around uh, getting to 150. Um, I, uh, we're, we're starting to have conversations around succession because um, the, uh, you know, I think the, the, the level of energy that's required to drive this uh, type of business uh, is, uh, uh, is, is quite substantial. And I have no intention of walking away just yet. Uh, but I think I need to ensure uh, that we have succession in place. Uh, you know, and if you look at what's gone on the last week with uh, Joe Smith, and uh, you know, they, he he clearly had a very strong uh, su- uh, succession agenda. Um, so, in the last number of years, I've got uh, involved in a couple of other smaller businesses as a as a as a as as, an inve- as a small investor. Some connected to the EOI program. And uh, I'd like to do more of that, but I can only do more of that when uh, I'm doing less with an ergo. Will you be sad when that time comes? I uh, I think it's a it's you know ergo is a it's a it's a huge part of my life. My 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 wife said at one stage that she never uh, worried about me having an affair because I was uh, I was so involved. The mistress is the business <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> uh, I'm not sure what all that says, but but uh, it's, it's it's probably a, a fair a fair uh, reflect reflection. Um, so I I I I've also had conversations with Audrey about. Um, we both believe that I'll never retire. Um, I just do different things. Okay, John Purdy, thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for joining us today on The Architects of Business. Thanks to our guests, John Purdy, our producer, Patrick Hohey, and all of the team here at Joe. Our show is made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Go to eoy.ie to learn more about the finalists for this year. And don't miss out on past or future editions of The Architects of Business by subscribing for free on iTunes, on your favourite Android podcast app, or you can watch us on YouTube too. Check out some of Joe's other shows as well, including Ireland Unfiltered with Dion Fanning and Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby. I'm Ty Genwright. Thanks very much for being with us today and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>